Hi, I'm Don Marie Solis, and I run EQ Solutions U 2.0. And today I am talking to Maya DiGiorgio, an amazing comedian and human and a friend of mine since we were kids. And I'm so excited to be talking to her because we don't do this often enough. <laughs> And so I am not going to introduce you as well as you can. How about you let people who are going to watch this know who you are and what you're about? Oh, well, um, I'm a comedian. Uh, I'm at my father's house in Florida, but I'm a New Yorker. And even though I have been living in um, Hollywood as well, and I've known Dawn forever. And so I'm just open for questions and sounding board because... Uh, Dawn has like been a big sister to me through the toughest times in my life. So I'm just grateful to be on you on with your, your podcast and broadcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. You have such a unique background. Um, and you, yeah, I mean, man, you've been through some tough stuff in your life. You, mm -hmm. you do comedy, um, in a way that I really relate to. You're a storyteller. Uh, you know, I've watched some of your routines over and over and over again, and I laugh at them just as much and sometimes more the more I watch them. Um, but also having known you for the vast majority of my life, I feel like I have uh, a good sense of who you are as a human. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I appreciate you so much. And I guess one of the things that I would first like to hear about is how you ended up getting into comedy like okay. I mean you used to toss out the jokes and stuff like that when we were in school but I would have seen you like somewhere in the film industry I would have like I knew I knew the arts of some that, that was, yeah but I wouldn't have predicted yeah. comedy like how did that happen well, I think um, the first thing was, is that I just come from a family of performers. My parents met in an acting school. My mother performed all over the world as what they'd call a chanteuse. She sang in seven languages and she was a concert level pianist. And your mom's and name? So Sylvia Copeland. Her. Sylvia Copeland. And, um, and so as a child, uh, I have never done anything else. I've had... Um, even my mother said when I was a, uh, before I was born, the only time I'd kick is when she'd play the piano. So she thought I'd be a tap oh. dancer and a, and a drummer, <laughs> which is, <laughs> and you which was, yes, I am. Um, my, my uncle was a, a, a Tony award winning choreographer, um, Henry Latang, uh, who taught Gregory Hines and was choreographed the movie tap and cotton club. And so as a kid between the both of them, they had me running from auditions and sitting in tap school and, um, and being um, performers of color, especially coming from that many years ago, uh, working in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, they came from the old school, which is you better sing like hell and dance like hell and play an instrument. You better just, you know, every single thing that you can do. Um, so, I think so my wait, because people who don't know you don't don't know your your parental background to give them a quick snippet. My, my mother's my mother's African American. My father's um, Sicilian by way of Africa by Somalia, uh, but he was after uh, World War II. Uh, my grandfather came to America and and um, they lived in like Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and they became very traditional blue collar Italian family. Uh, Sicilian family in, in America um, going through that journey and them living through their war was a rich story but um, my parents uh, got married before it was considered legal in 17 states and but being New Yorkers and being artists that was kind of we were like the hip mixed kids were always like the progressed out of um, that New York uh, scene so but my uncle uh, being a choreographer my mother always from it was funny. I, I went, me, uh, Dawn and I know each other from uh, Christian Science School, uh, elementary school, junior high school, high school. So um, I remember years later after my mom had passed, I walked into um, a Christian Science reading room and a woman was describing my mother to this other woman. She said, oh, you should have, you should have wished you had met this woman. She was phenomenal, this incredible artist. She sang and, and this woman said, wait a minute, like 25 years ago, there was like a Christmas party and this woman got up and she was the most incredible singer I ever sang. And she had two little, 
two little girls that she had sing Muskrat Love. And I was like, <laughs> it was like, sing I, I, yeah, my mother always, because we were little, so she thought it was cute. She always did cute, cute little numbers for us. And I told my sister, she was like, oh no, I remember that. I tried to block it out. And um, it's funny because she was such a unique uh, performer, but she always had us performing and singing and tapping. And it, it was just, it was, there was music constantly. There were people walking in and out the house with a big bass and another person coming in and out with drums. So I, I, I was a drummer, um, very young. I took to the drums. I played piano, but I really loved drumming. And um, my problem was I couldn't do anything seriously because like even if I was drumming, it's, you know, I, when I tap, I'd make a stupid face. <laughs> I just, I had to. So my uncle used to call me the comedian. And um, I was, my mother would have never let me go into comedy. Uh, but we worked on a film when I was young. We all got booked on a on a film that was like tap and singing and everything. And I, after that, I really wanted to get into filmmaking. And my mother wanted me to go to like Juilliard as a percussionist, but um, I really wanted to, I loved um, film production because you can sing and you can write and you can dance and you can you can do all these things from a director's perspective. Yeah. So so that was why I wanted to be a filmmaker so desperately in high school and went to um, School of Visual Arts for continuing ed. And I was taking 16 millimeter classes. I mean, I was like a real dork. I didn't go out on dates or parties. I was always working on a script or something. Um, and you have made a, a few films, right? Yeah, 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 I have. And um, Hollywood, is Hollywood Outlaw publicly yeah, available? Yeah, it was, no, it isn't. None it isn't? Bummer. Nope, nope, no. Ah. Um, so it's been, um, but it did all the festival circuits and, you know, we did Tribeca and um, uh, Slam Dance and uh, Aspen and uh, Cinequest, all the top festivals, yeah. Scotland, it showed in London. Um, but what happened was, is um, I didn't want to set up light stands and I couldn't afford to make a film. And I said, either I'm going to have to go down the road of doing that kind of work or I can go and perform. So I went to acting school um, and I had a lot of characters and, and my friend just talk, talked to me into it. I said, I never wanted to be a comedian, never wanted to be a comedian, ever. I remember saying defiantly, I was never going to be a comedian. Um, Make the universe I, laugh by announcing your plans, right? <laughs> oh yeah, right, right. And then um, I wanted to do this. I, someone said, try your one person material, one person show material out in a comedy club and just, just do it for that, just to try it out. And so I did that and then I became obsessed with what worked and what didn't work and why and how to get more stage time. And then I saw people actually getting agents and TV credits and getting booked as an actress. And so I, I figured that was gonna be a nice shortcut. <laughs> a shortcut, <laughs> the long way around the block now, but Cha -cha! yeah. yeah. But I, I kept, and then I, and then when comedy became a little bit crazy for me, I then went back and, and um, made the comedy films that I did. And then I, I did two, two cuts of it. So it's uh, Bitter Jester and Hollywood Outlaw were the two, uh, two versions of the same film. One's like a director's cut. Cool. And either one of them available where somebody could watch it? Nope. Oh, we're going to get those available. <laughs> So yeah, but that was, um, so that was like, that was my journey. And then I came back to comedy a few years ago and, um, you know, it's all, it's kind of like starting over. Um, but, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a, it's been a peaceful once I've gotten back in, it kind of just is something that works for me more than like, it's just weird. Like I don't seem to make a living doing anything but comedy. Yeah. I, I can nothing, all my backup plans fail. <laughs> I was like, I'll do anything, like websites, and then yeah. I'll create all these yeah. other things. But yeah. no, no. Yeah, the it's the same with me. I, I have tried to be several different versions of myself, and I always come back to this emotional intelligence, help people get in tune with themselves, help people like see their life and go get it. Yeah, I. I yeah, mean, that's you, kind of you your knew me in high school, and I was like that in high school, right? That's I'm what just, I was gonna say. I, I, you're like, I had a problem. You go to dawn. That's what you yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, even people who, um, for, you know, their own reasons, really, really did not care for me as, as a person would end up in my dorm room. I know I don't like you, but I also know you give the best advice. So like, here's my thing. 
<laughs> well, you know, I think there's a term I'm finally understanding because I always wanted to, um, I never wanted to be a rebel, but my life kind of placed me in like a rebel mm -hmm. space. Um, so I never, it, it kind of was accidental of not fitting in. And um, one of the things that I learned later was, you know, and you're the specific person of, you've always lived a higher standard um, and it's a choice. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing that sometimes a higher standard isn't considered like the, the coolest thing, but ultimately it's a, it's a way to maintain peace. And so you were just a, a very enlightened person, very young. And I think Aww. that, and that, that's, that, that, that makes people fear you when they're off doing foolishness that they know they're going to end up paying a price for and then you got to straighten it up you not, know what I mean not for I never <laughs> just a single human like I think that's very hard for people to understand about me is that I'm so open to every version of individual right I I will appreciate and like almost anybody and I think that's very hard to understand you know mm -hmm. like that that I, I've had people say to me you can't be real that has to be disingenuous no nobody yeah. can be who you are and I, I appreciate that perspective, but if people hang in there with me, they realize, oh yeah, mm -hmm. weird, but true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. It's, you know, I, I, I think I've also, um, I, like, it's funny, I'm, I'm working on some, some narratives now as I'm, as I'm trying to be, stay creative during the time off from the shows and, and realizing the same thing. Like, I was like, wow, here I am always feeling like I, I was doing things that were wrong. And I think that problem was I was kind of a goody two-shoes and maybe more of a know-it-all <laughs> by accident like you can't do that that's not right like <laughs> nobody appreciates that and I was like how was I doing that one like you know yeah I had to learn my way out of that yeah no one appreciates that <laughs> yeah it was funny because I, I I kind of feel a lot like I, when when Reese Witherspoon did that when election first came out that movie election I <laughs> I kind of identified that with like a little bit too much. Like people are going to sabotage her just for being like too right, you know, for the job. And I'm like, and now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really that character. And, then, and yeah, maybe a little bit of a snob, but I've tried not to be. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, oh boy. There are certain places where I've decided to deeply own my snobbishness. Like <laughs> coffee. I'm sorry. Snob. I own it. I love it. Right. Food snob own it love it and it's one of the things that i've enjoyed about my journey okay i'm gonna pause for a second can okay. you hear my dog in the background it's okay i can probably match with my father who is a um a chain smoker who just walks out and coughs so okay. as you get like rough rough mine's going like ah, 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 okay. and it probably All sounds right. like it's it's it may not I, even be we love dog. you daddy to george it might, be, um, it might be so. it might just it might not even be your dog. It might be my father. It sounds the okay. Same. So if anybody can hear this in the background, I have an 11 week old puppy that Aww. I was hoping if I let her be in her kennel, she'd be pleased. Uh, she's not pleased. <laughs> so working from home, I'm not, I, I was joking with Maya in the beginning before we started recording, cause I have this, this artificial back. Like if I move my hand, it goes, it goes away. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I have an artificial background. I'm not the Anironics. <laughs> I'm in my office, but I didn't have time to tidy um, before this <laughs> So, Adderall ducks. Um, but anyways, sorry about the dog. But uh, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I've really learned, the more I've investigated, um, so my practice is, is based a lot on my life experience, but also in my study of a, a branch of psychology called positive psychology. And basically, um, clinical psychology will uh, take a look at the problem and diagnose it and, and work problem forward, uh, which is great. And positive psychology looks at uh, who you are and, and what you have within you, even if it's unrealized, and builds from there, mm -hmm. which carries the issues along with them to some kind of, of solution, right? So both are very valid, but I relate more to start with the good that you've got, even if you don't know you have it and build mm. from there. That's what I mm -hmm. relate to. Um, and then nonviolent communication, which is a, a theory uh, designed by Mar Marshall Rosenberg, which again is find your deepest, most centered self and, and communicate from there, whether you're communicating to yourself, to others. Um, 
So there's a lot that goes into my practice, but it comes from this this space of needing needing to be there myself, right? Mm -hmm. I need to like me in order to to present these ideas that I so relate to. And so I've come to a point where I, I really enjoy what I have felt I've learned about the difference between um, antagonistic ego and mm -hmm. a joy of self, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if I make a meal and I dig in and I go, oh my gosh, this is so good. I'm appreciating the stuff that's coming out of me. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean I can't appreciate the stuff that's coming out of somebody else, right? Yeah. So antagonistic yeah. ego, like I'm me and I'm awesome. And that means you're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Where definitely. an appreciation of self says I'm awesome and you're awesome. And oh my gosh, this is so cool, right? <laughs> we don't yeah, have no, the same. We don't have, like, we can be very similar or we can be very, very different. And we can so enjoy Mm -hmm. who each one of us is while mm -hmm. we enjoy who we are ourselves. Yes. Um, my humor used to be very self-deprecating. It is occasionally still just because I find that hilarious. The <laughs> difference is I no longer believe the bad stuff, right? I can make a joke without feeling badly about myself. So yeah. the, even my sense of humor is changing from self-deprecating to self-enjoyment right? I can mm -hmm. enjoy the ways I screw up. I don't have to feel badly about it, but I can make jokes yeah. about it, right? I can mm -hmm. be funny yeah. and silly in that space. Absolutely. But that's not critical. That's enjoyment. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that draws me so much to your brand of comedy is you can be very real about who you are, what your life experiences have been, but I never never have felt like you're putting yourself down or you're putting anybody else down. You're living the joy of your truth. Well, I think, I think it's a, there's a few things that, I mean, because, you know, I'm working on something and I've been looking at a lot of my original stand up, and it really was, um, I, I see as how much of it was for me to cope. Like I'm looking at myself as a young comedian, like when I first, first started and before a lot of, things that were very dark about the comedy circuit and nightclub circuit itself kind of interfered in my um in my experience and i do see i see someone who's going through a lot of um i i'd say they were very painful experiences but for, for some reason um comedy allowed me to um just be direct and express them and 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 see and and when you got people when people would laugh at that it made me okay. I, I, you know, it made me feel like okay, I'm yeah. not wrong. In oh, in my opinion about what I just saw, like, it, it, is it me or is this a crazy scenario? So, I'm sorry, you're gonna say something. I, we had a little bit of a snafu with you freezing, but it caught itself up. It's all good. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, so what what went on is, you know, and and I think that there was a time when I did get into darker comedy. Um, and I think it was me trying to be com like more like comedians that I looked up to, mm -hmm. um, more than, um, me being, um, be being, um, de self-deprecating because I wanted to be, I just, I, I, I had comedian friends that I really thought they were so funny and I wanted to be more like them. And I wanted to uh, shift my style. I wanted to be a comic that could stand behind a mic like this. And, and I can sometimes, but that's not really my natural style. My natural style is to be bouncing off the walls because I've just, that's just kind of how my energy is. Yeah. And it was very hard for me, I think for a long time when I did uh, negative comedy because I couldn't, it's like, I felt like I was cutting myself off from my inspiration. Um, and it, I had to kind of soul search to be free enough to know that um, it was going to be okay, or it can get better, or it can, which is weird because it was that comes from where I was probably in the mo more painful spot of my career, and not my career in my life. I think the most personally painful time. I was not as I wasn't mean. And then when I got to a point where I thought I should react mean, then 
my comedy got darker, but I couldn't really, um, it was not making me happy. Comedy was not funneling into a heavy, in a, in a happy place, whether it was making people laugh or not, it just, just didn't feel right. Um, and it took a while for me to kind of, I think it's the hopelessness that can drop where your comedy is. And even I was in, in the darkest time when I started, I think doing comedy with my story ended up getting me to a place where I still felt just expressing it of the moment was making me feel better. It was repairing it at that moment. So, cause comedy is very instant in the moments. Um, and that's why I do like it. Cause you don't have to have a whole crew show up. You don't have to have, you don't have to have like the editor and the writer and the producer and the lighting and the sound guy. You just grab a mic and you just go do it. And that, yeah. that ended up being very freeing. Um, and I, I, I even feel constricted by the microphone and my style of comedy. I actually, whenever the sound in the microphone goes off in the room, like the, the tech guys in the room, they start panicking and the club owner panics. I'm like, oh, thank God. Now I can just be myself and really talk to the audience. And those are always my better shows because I, I just feel much more um, connected. But yeah. I think the hardest part, and I think most of the comedians that I know, it's like how to survive comedy. It's like surviving this business of, things of people being unfair and people being manipulative and people just wanting something and um, and getting to being genuine. And, and I think that that has been uh, many years of a struggle for me. Um, and even today I was thinking about how dark my experience has been in the comedy world. Um, but then I thought, well, I can live to a higher standard. And if I, if I craft my comedy the right way and I come from a place where I'm working on uplifting that audience, then I can then lead as opposed to just fall behind, not realizing when you're, when you're standing up for your truth, like I did in the beginning, um, I was leading. And it's taken me many years to go, no, 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 this is gonna be my own style of comedy. And this is what feels right for me because it, it, but because it also comes from my, my background, my family, my schooling, my education of, of who you are. So, I mean, some comedians work differently, but I've, I've really found that it, it doesn't, it, it, never inspired me to go back to comedy after all these years um, to go back and think I'm going to get my career on track. But it, but my career has come back and I've been inspired to go back into these rooms that are so dark because I'm thinking, well, it's my job to bring the light. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. I, I love it. Yeah. So love it's like, it. how can I bring light now? And, and then you, I'm dealing with racial divides in my material and rooms. Room setups are very different in different cultures it's 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 wild and even if you have a multicultural audience you can feel the pockets so i i feel like um i each culture has a different way of speaking italian culture um, italian americans speak very different and it, it's very different for women dealing with italian um men a certain way um uh, african-american culture uh, black comedy is completely different from white comedy so something you'll get a room a laugh in a black room might freak people out in a white room when they just clam up and then you got to calm the white people down and then you could do your white humor which never really the black room doesn't find that funny it's considered more humorous as opposed yeah. to i'm gonna fall on the floor so there's multi layers um and also too like i'm in florida now and this is like i said it's a deep uh, trump country this is where the tea party started um in in fort myers florida and uh to work here it's how do you speak to people? Because in New York, it was like, I don't care. I'm just going to say what I'm going to say and you catch up or you don't catch up. And when you start that's to play New the, York, that's yeah, New York. That's, that's yeah. New York. Yeah. When you play the countryside, I realized there are people who need to hear and have their thought more open to diversity and to understanding that the American experience is different for everybody, not assuming because everyone assumes, well, they're having the same experience as me. Mm -hmm. um, so they, so this must be that. And so they draw their conclusions from something that they haven't experienced. So if you can break through uh, people's psych psychology, but yet make them feel loved and service them as a comedian, make them laugh and make them let go. And, you know, you have a little tool, you know, a laugh can make someone let go of a stronghold. So there's a tool. So I can, if I can get you to let go of the stronghold, then I can give you a joke that that you can appreciate um, and maybe learn something and then give you a little simple punchline afterwards. I th and, and so that's what happened with the, especially the dry bar set. Um, I, my manager called and I, I know I did deaf comedy jam and back in back a million years ago. And 
people always assume that you had to be really dirty to do Def Jam. And someone gave me a dirty joke to close with. Um, it wasn't my joke. Um, I was just so relieved to actually pull it off. Um, <laughs> I was like, I pulled it off. You know, I, was like, I, didn't, think I, I didn't think I was gonna get, get that far. Um, that's like the, the creme de la creme of uh, black comedians to play that, to be accepted in that world. And I was accepted for who I am. I wasn't brought in as, oh, this is a white comedian playing a black. Literally the first white comedian to play Def Jam was Rich Voss who played the day after me. He was taped the day after me. So wow. I was accepted for exactly who I am. Um, and um, to get over that triumph uh, was like, yes. But then years later, people analyze your career about, oh, well, you said a dirty word on that joke and that must be you. And you're like, look, Dave Chappelle has told 20,000 million jokes. No one judges him on one joke from 20 years ago because his career, you know, kept right. going. So right now you end up under the microscope to come back in. Yeah. So for my manager to get me a dry bar comedy piece, which is you go to Provo, Utah, and people who don't know the Mormon culture, um, every time you see a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, is a little guy pointing, and he's pointing in the direction of Provo, Utah. This is the holy land. <laughs> That's right. Mormons. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, you, so my manager said, can you be clean? I said, yes, of course I can be clean. You know, I'm, I'm living with Christian science nurses right now. <laughs> Actually, I was in Princeton with the head of the Christian science, you know, uh, nursing facility, of course. And he says, well, um, and they laugh at me, you know, that's like, and they laugh. So I got to be, so he goes, well, can you be Mormon clean? I was like, I don't even know what Mormon clean is. Um, so we get there and so I get to Provo and, um, I said, just don't tell them I'm a Def, I'm a Def Jam comic because I don't want them to cancel me. So I got out there. They put me on. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so different because people were shocked my hair was curly. They really were. They were like, wow, your hair is curly. Like, it was, everyone looked like Ivanka Trump. It was <laughs> kind of crazy. There wasn't even like a blemish in the audience. It was very, 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 very um, white, Mormon, um, non-diverse. Um, but they were open to diversity. And in the back, they had a bar and their bar at the back of the dry bar club, nightclub, comedy club, where they shoot out of is all sugar. It's like, like this green syrupy drink and then this like pink syrupy drink and then gummy bears. Because there's no was alcohol. Like, it was, they, they go out and drink sugar and they act right. like they're still high off of sugar. It's still yeah. the same. <laughs> so it was crazy. It was, it was wonderful. So they, um. But they, they welcomed me there and I was surprised. Uh, you have to look for the relation points. Like if you talk to a stranger on the street, you look, first thing you do is you, what do you have in common? Oh, we both are having problems with the shopping cart. You know, mm -hmm. oh, oh, did you get the milk on sale? You find a common ground. And once you could find that little human ki kind ground and they were so loving, it was just a loving environment. And so, right. you know, it's about finding, you know, great comedians can always find like what is happening in the room and you acknowledge that and then you work from that. So it's, yeah, you know, you pick that. So that's Now people where, can see that routine, right? The the dry yeah. comedy bar. Dry bar comedy. Yeah, yeah, you can go to the dry bar app for the full special. I think they put the full special on YouTube too. Okay, um, great. Yeah, so, but that's, but that's kind of what it is. If I go to, you know, I've had to perform it like, you know, like the KKK, Capitol and Fort Wayne, Indiana, Indiana, which is like right down the street from the KKK headquarters and guys with Confederate hats on. And, you know, it was like this, my opening line was, I didn't know Duck Dynasty had a fashion line, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's different culture from what I'm used to seeing in New York. Yeah. Um, you know, these are people after the show that, you know, wanted to actually want to discuss race. They like, I never thought of it that way. Um, can we talk? And then I end up there for like hours with people. So then I feel like it, it, you're making a difference wherever you go. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. So dry bar comedy app. Is there any place else people can see your work right now while we're doing COVID and nobody you can, can go on, like just go on YouTube um, and just put my name in the dry bar should come up. The special is called my opinion. And um, that was uh <laughs> It was kind of funny because I, when I, before I taped, I called my um, Christian science practitioner and he gave me this, um, he gave me this quote to hang on to before I taped, which was right motives gives pinions to thought and strength and freedom to speech and action. 
And that's a Mary Baker Eddy quote. So I hung on to right motives, give pinions. So I kept thinking, what are my motives? And, um, and then I thought of two things before this. This taping I liked because I, I didn't do exactly, well, I didn't write down what I was gonna do. I kind of um, just went and had fun. And I remember watching, I used to watch a lot of Dave Chappelle closely and uh, Tony Woods closely before they would tape their specials. And they never did exactly. They kind of had it mm-hmm. in their head, but they never did it. So I said, let me, let me fake like I have confidence here. And my motives are to just bring them joy. So, and then about two months later, Drybar called and said, what do you want to, um, what do you want to name your special? So I posted on Facebook, what should I name it? And a guy that I, I, he, I had worked for, his name was Walter, um, randomly, I had never even met him. He wrote, how about Maya Pinion? So pinions to thought, which is edges yep. of the wings that give you a little bit high, extra height. I like that on the, it works with the light, little, little extra height pinion. <laughs> so it gave me a little extra pinion height. And this random, random gentleman that had, had booked me that I never met before came up with that title. That's so awesome. That pretty cool. <laughs> that is very cool. That is very cool. A little, little spirit, <laughs> spiritual, a little universal spiritual mojo. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's awesome. That's I think awesome. he stormed the Capitol though last week. <laughs> I'm not kidding. All right. <laughs> We're not going to judge. We're not going to judge. Are we trying to be loving? Like, okay. <laughs> oh, lovingly, you know, okay, loving you. Okay. Oh my goodness. It has been okay. so amazing to talk to you. I want to talk to you again as soon as we can. I know you're crazy busy right now, um, but uh, we should probably cap it here so that people actually have time to watch this. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, if you want to come back but and discuss anything else, I'm always I available. I do. There's so many different things I want to pick your brains on. Um, but I hope people do go out and get the uh, Dry Bar Comedy app and watch you. There's so many talented comedians on that app. It's really, really yeah. worth it. It's all free. Um, you can tip, you know, like a restaurant. You can yeah. tip your comedians. Um, mm-hmm. But definitely go and, and like, you know, do the like thing and, and support these folks. Uh, This is a really, really tough time to be being a performer because there aren't a lot of ways to get your art out there. Um, So yeah, I hope everybody will go check that out. I will put uh, as many links as I can in the uh, description of this on YouTube when this gets edited. I know. I can't can't believe comedians can get unemployment. I got unemployment. So did you really? Yeah. Yeah. My manager had me, my manager, Tom, um, over at Omnipop had me working so much the last year and a half and um, that I was am able to be on you know I'm on my unemployment and I'm just writing more doing more stuff creating That's more good stuff, so. I'm so glad yeah I, I I'm grateful for that too that expansion has been been really amazing for folks um, so I'm going to to cap it here and thank you thank you thank you for making this time for me Absolutely. and for sharing your heart um, I'm going to put links to Maya in, in the description and maybe in the comments on YouTube. And I'm going to put a link to my website, EQ Solutions, the letter U, and then we'll share it all over everywhere. I know we're going to share it all over the place. Um, for me, you can look at my website and look for, uh, my blogs and my classes and all the things you can do with me. Uh, and then definitely go check out Maya and see her brilliance at work too freaking funny for your own good so i love you lady i will talk I love to you, you soon I love you. and good all luck right. with everything call me whenever thanks. you need me like you've let me do for you for 20 all right. years. <laughs> thanks so much bye bye